Okay there, saints, Exodus chapter 32. Let's bow our hearts. Lord, we're so grateful that as we have journeyed through this book and we have seen just your children, we've seen you reveal yourself to them. And Father, now you're, in a sense, going to test them. It's an amazing thing, Lord, that um, with you, when we're tested, it isn't failure and being kicked out. It's, it's simply just evidence of where we are, evidence of, of what we need to grow in. And we're just so grateful, Lord, that, that you do not condemn us. Mm. Um, so, Father, you, you do seek to grow us. You do seek that we would understand the truth of who we are and how we are. And, and as we understand that truth, Lord, more and more, it's, it's, a, it's a greater beauty to understand who you are. And so, Tonight, Lord, truly, we ask for ears to hear what your spirit would speak to us, your church. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All, right. All right, Saints, Exodus chapter 32. It's a longer chapter, and what we're going to do is we're going to simply break it down as we go through this. So tonight, we're going to be just looking at the first six verses as we look at the reasons for sin. And then next week, we'll look at the response to sin and, of course, we'll deal with that in a more greater area. Um, when we hit verse 15, we'll look at the results of sin, consequences, and then we'll look at the, the, the reparation for sin, the atonement, once we get into to the verse 30. So those are the, the foundations that we're looking at as we go through this chapter. So what I would recommend is for the next month or so, just keep reading through the chapter. Um, even though we've covered the first six verses, you know, as you start reading, read through the first six verses again, keep it in its context, keep it into its flow so that you can really understand what's happening. When we come here, we'll try to break it down into the foundational truths that the, 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 the scriptures declare what's going on here. So let's just read through these first six verses and um, then we'll get on with our study. Now, Exodus 32, verse 1. Now, when the people saw that Moses delayed coming down from the mountain, the people gathered together to Aaron and said to him, Come, make us gods that shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And Aaron said to them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people broke off the earrings which were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand, and he fashioned with it an engraving tool. And he fashioned it with an engraving tool and made a molded calf. Then they said, This is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. So when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. And they rose early on the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up. To play. As we understand, this first section is going to be dealing with the reasons for sin. And it's interesting that at this point in time, understand that two events, two situations are happening simultaneously. God is speaking to Moses all of these words that we've been covering in the last couple of months. God is speaking to Moses over and over again. Let me give you an idea of what Moses is going through during this time. Moses in Exodus 30 verse 11, it simply says this, Then the Lord spoke to Moses. In verse 17, it declares once again, then the Lord spoke to Moses. In verse 22, moreover, the Lord spoke to Moses. Verse 34, and the Lord said to Moses. Chapter 31, verse 1, and then the Lord spoke to Moses. Verse 12, and the Lord spoke to Moses. Boy, he's just getting just 
just declaration after declaration after declaration. So what we see here is the Holy Spirit literally wants to re-remind us who it is that's speaking to Moses all these things. Just so he doesn't say one time the Lord spoke to Moses and all these things. Then each new item, the Holy Spirit distinctly speaks out and the Lord spoke to Moses. And what is Israel doing during this time? Well, there in verse 1, now when the people saw that Moses delayed coming down to the mountain, the people gathered together to Aaron and said, Come, make us gods that shall go before us. As for Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. So Moses was hearing from God, hanging out with God. Israel was just waiting to say, come on, let's get on with the show. Let's get on with the show. We're waiting. If Moses hasn't showed up by now, apparently it's not going to happen. Let's just make our own gods. Let's do our own thing. Let's just carry it, carry on to what we're going to do. I want to show you the conclusions of the two. If you turn to Exodus 34, Strike that Exodus chapter 35. In Exodus chapter 35, it makes this statement, and I want to read from verses 29. Um, nope, I was right. Exodus 34, verse 29. That's what we're after. So in Exodus chapter 34, verse 29, it says, Now it was so when Moses came down from Mount Sinai, and the two tablets of testimony were in Moses' hand when he came down from the mountain, that Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone while he talked with them. So when Aaron the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. And then Moses called them, and Aaron and all the rulers of the congregation returned to him. And Moses talked with them, and afterwards all the children of Israel came near, and he gave them as commandments all that the Lord had spoken with him on Mount Sinai. And when the, Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. When Moses is talking to the Lord, as he's hanging out with the light, he's becoming a part of the light. And it's a beautiful thing to see this is what's happening when Moses is there, in a sense, talking to the Lord and listening to the Lord and being with the Lord, just hanging out with the Lord. Now, for the children of Israel, it's a little bit different. In Exodus chapter 32, beginning in verse 7 and verse 30, I want to read just those two verses to you. But here the Lord said to Moses, Go down for your people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. So Moses is there hanging out with God. The people who are not looking and waiting on God, who are not looking forward to God and seeing what God is doing, they're just saying, hey, come on, let's get on with the show. It really makes a bold statement about them that here God says they have corrupted themselves. In verse 30, it says this, Now it came to pass on the next day that Moses said to the, to the people, You have committed a great sin. Oh my goodness. Do you want to see the two contrasts? One is hanging out with God. Shekinah. One is saying, come on, let's get on the road. We're, we've been waiting on this too long. We're, we've got to get moving here. They're the ones that are rushing things. They are the ones that have corrupted themselves. And so I want you to understand that the people, according to verse 30, Moses says, you guys have committed a great sin. And within this, I think it's just a really good question to ask ourselves and to really come to the scriptures and say, why is this happening? What's the purpose? What's going on here? Why do the people commit a great sin? And basically, there's a pretty good reason and understanding of, of why we sin. Paul does something amazing. He spends some time in Romans chapter 3, and he quotes multiple, multiple Old Testament sources. 
And he just simply says it's written, it's written. And then he begins to quote Psalms. He begins to quote Isaiah. He begins to, you know, quote um, Ecclesiastes. He's quoting all these different things. And, but he makes this statement in, in Romans chapter 3. I want to read verses 10 to 18 just so you get a good idea of why is it that we sin? Well, Paul declares this in Romans 3 verse 10. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. Their throat is an open tomb. And their tongues, with their tongues, they have practiced deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. This is the reality of the human nature. This is who we are. Paul says something unique in the second chapter of Ephesians. I want to read you the first four verses, but he says, In you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. So basically, the he made alive isn't in the text. It's if, you're, if you're following along, you'll see that your Bible is in italics. So I would simply read it, And you, were, you who were dead in trespasses and sins, and once you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom we also, we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others." Now, on Sunday, we kind of looked at the natures. Um, we were there in the Gospel of John, and there we were looking at that whole passage where Jesus would make that statement in John 10, 13. He says, the hireling flees because he's a hireling. It's, it's a really kind of outside passage, but it's such a powerful word because it doesn't say that because he fleed, he's now the hireling. No, no, he, the hireling flees because he's a hireling, because that's his nature. He's going to do what is his nature to do. And I think what's important is once we as people begin to grasp the extent and the depth of our sin and the enormity of its required punishment, what God says, I need to do this to sin. Remember, first sin, God told Adam, in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Children of Israel here, as you have been reading through this chapter, as we continue to read through the chapter, God's going to say, let's just wipe them all out. <laughs> just let them all die. I can start over with you, Moses. Let's just do that. It's, it's fine, but let them all die. But but once we understand the extent and the depth of our sins, the enormity of its required punishment, then we can begin to understand the beauty and the cost of God's plan for our redemption. Well, what he does to, to free us of our sins through the death of Jesus Christ on the cross, and then we can, in this place of awe and worship, and, and give God the glory that should be given to him for this incredible gift, this, this gift of grace that he gives us life forever and ever. He gives us favor with him forever and ever, things that we didn't deserve. And so what is the depths of our sin? When we understand and we're asking this question, why in the world are they sinning? What is going on in this situation? Keep in mind that the very nature of who we are is sin. We are born with a sin nature. So that, that's the, the, the bottom thing. 
that, that nature is our sin. We are by simply nature children of wrath, and so we're born in sin. We have a pre-existing inclination towards sin. We are hardwired at birth to go into sin, to rebel against God. Um, that we want to, when there's any form that God uses to declare his authority, and in any form that would take, we're hardwired to say, no, not me. Your word may be for someone else, it may be for this, and but it, it's not for me. I think most of us are like those people there in, in Luke 19, verse 14, where they said, we will not have this man to rule over us. I don't want to have authority. I don't want someone telling me what to do. And, and so we spent the, you know, usually about the time we hit, some of us go younger, where we start at two. Most of us start right around 14, 15, 16, where it's like, I don't need to be told what to do all the time. I'm, you know, I'm just about an adult. I'm going to be a man. I'll make my own decisions. Let me start now, those kind of things. And so, but we don't want to have someone rule over us. We, we want to say, hey, you know what, for, for the most part, I understand that, that I might do things wrong. I understand that I might fail. And I like to couch these words in those types of sentences. But what we don't like to say is this, sin. As soon as you say the word sin, now all of a sudden you have God in the equation. See, I can simply say, I made a wrong choice. Well, that's fine. Then, then make a better choice. But, but when I say I've sinned in that choice, now what? Now God's in that picture, and there's an affront against God in that picture. There's a whole other connotation that comes with it. Keep in mind that, and I love what, what Paul does, because when he wrote to the, the, the church in Rome, I want to read you a couple passages in Romans chapter 5. And I, I don't want to read it. All in its context, I'm going to nickel and dime it. So you read it in its context in Romans chapter 5. I'm going to start reading in verse 12. I'm going to read down through verse 9, or I'm going to read from 12, 15, and 19. You can simply read it in your context on your own after this. But it says in verse 12 of Romans 5, it says, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, through Adam sin came, and death reigned through sin. Thus, death spread to all men because all sin. All have received this sin nature through the one man, Adam. In verse 15, but the free gift is not like the offense. For if by one man's offense, that is Adam, many died. In other words, we're born dead in our sins. Much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. So now we begin to see this whole area of you have Adam being this one representative of the human race because he sinned. He now gives his genetics. He passes those on to his children. Now we understand how genetics work. And we kind of look like an uncle or a grandfather or, or a brother or, 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 you know, we look like our mother or grandmother, but we look like someone. We may have the same color eyes, the same shape of body. And then you have where you pass on genetics. But amazingly, Adam does the same thing. Only one gene he passed on. He passed on the sin gene. And every one of us received that. We may look different on the outward, but on the inside, we receive that one gene. In verse 19, he says, For by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. Also by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. So as Adam will be that, that head that is the representative to all men, Jesus will become that head. He'll become the representative to all who receive him. There's another passage very similar, but I want to share it with you in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 22. It simply makes this statement, 1 Corinthians 15, 22. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. So once again, over and over, Paul makes this statement that because of Adam, because of his sin, we all die. So people often, when they look at sin, when they look at wrongs, when they look at those things, what we have a tendency to do, we look at the effects of the sin 
without looking at the very nature of sin. In other words, this happened, this happened, and so we say these effects took place without looking at the very nature. Why did it happen? Why, why do I have this bent? Why am I hardwired towards this way? And so, like I said, we could say, hey, I made a mistake, or I failed, or I stumbled, I made a bad choice. And as long as I don't refer to God, then it's just me and my opinion, you and your opinions. Mm -hmm. And so, so often we say, oh, I made a bad choice. And then, no, no, you were right. You were okay. It's because of this. And, and so I'm going to be looking for those people who agree with me and, and try to justify what I've done, lessen the impact of what I've done. But as soon as I say I've sinned, I can't lessen that impact anymore. Now it's a front to a holy God. Now at that point, once I say, hey, I've sinned, now I realize God's in the picture. And this implies, you know, the word sin implies it is against the law of God. It's against the heart of God. And so we, we recognize here that, that, that sin makes this declaration that I have failed in either one or more of God's laws. Anything that was of God's heart that he revealed through it, when I say I've sinned, I say I've now failed in that. And so where 1 John, when he writes in his epistle, chapter 3, verse 4, he makes it just a, an amazing statement. He simply says, sin is lawlessness. And I think it's important for us to, to you know, work that through because it's whoever commits sin commits lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. It's the failure of the law. And so... What, what sin implies is that I've absolutely, utterly, and without any shadow of doubt, I failed in keeping the words of God's heart. I, I've just, I, I've literally, I've fallen down so low when that comes. And so as he declares his heart, as he declares his authority, as he declares his word, all of that that's been declared, I can say, now I failed in it. Now, the Lord says this, if you fail in one point, you failed in its entirety. Right. So to, to take in, uh, you know, the, God's word in this, and so I realize that not only have I failed to, to, to keep them, but I realize that, that every man is in rebellion to God. Every man is hostile to his word. We don't want to have that authority in our lives. And as a Christian... All of a sudden, we accept Jesus. It's like, oh, now I want your authority until what? Until his word disagrees with something I want to do or in the timeline that I want to do it. Then who do I choose? Do, do I simply say, okay, God, your, your word says I can't do that? Or do I find a way to work around that word because I so want to do these things? And when you take a look at just how man is hostile to the word of God, Think about this for just a moment. God really says that two commandments are the basis of all things. Love God, love your neighbor, right? We know that. Do you see in our culture the love we have for one another? Now, I love the political ads. You can tell these people love each other. <laughs> they just truly love each other. You can see that the Republicans love the Democrats, the Democrats love the Republicans, and we are one nation under God. Mm -hmm. And it's an amazing thing to see. And yet we, we, we go around and we, we have this tendency of always wanting to do what? Jesus says, if you call someone a fool, you there, you're, you're ready for hellfire and the judgment. Now, we've never heard anyone in the political scene call someone else a fool. We've never ever looked to a... a, a one of our political leaders and said that they are a fool. You understand the very nature of who we are is to try to downplay someone else, to make them lesser and rather than build them up and edify. I don't know if your mother ever told you if you cannot say something good, don't say anything at all. But yet that's one truth that we're hardwired against. We like to say something bad, and if not to their face, then to anyone else who will listen. And, and that's the nature that we have. This is the bent that we take. And so we're, 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 we're angry with people. We lust after things. 
And rather than just being content in whatever state we are, like, oh, but I need this. I need something better. I need something new. I need this. And so we're lusting after people. We're lusting after things. And this we're hardwired to do. And it's not where we have to try to do it. It just becomes a natural thing. I'm amazed that when a little child, now my, my grandchildren are getting better at this, but when one has a toy and the other one, all of a sudden, they want that toy. They need that toy. They must have that toy. And amazingly, the younger they are, the more vocal they are towards that end. And sometimes they'll even go and they'll take that toy away from another child who has. And so we're trying to teach them, hey, listen, you'll get to play with it in time. Just now is not that time. And, and so the older grandchildren, they sort of said, well, hey, you know what? I'll, this is what I'll do. I want that toy. I'm going to just really like, like um, his name was Tom someone. Uh, Huckleberry Finn, Tom Sawyer. Tom Sawyer, the painting of the fence. He made it seem so good that everyone else just had to do it. My older grandchildren will do this with his wife. Oh, this is wonderful. Ooh, look at how it rolls. <laughs> and, and so all of a sudden, the little, I'll trade you. I'll trade you. And we have this nature of always wanting something. And it starts when we're little. It starts when we're so little. And so, and then, it, then it's, it's this, why do you think fashion trends are the way they are? Oh, I got to have that. I got to dress this way. Oh, this is the new thing. This is the new one. And, and eventually, you know, guys know this. They learn it from their fathers that eventually in 25 years, 35 years, this fat tra chain will come right back in. And, and that suit that you had that was there, it's going to come right back in style. You're going to have those wide ties. Eventually, I hate to say it, people are going to wear powder blue leisure suits again. <laughs> and, and, you know, if you have one, hang on to it. It's going to come back in style. Do you, do you realize that everything is, is, shows our nature? This is, this is hardwired in us. And, and what, I, what I find is interesting that, that Jesus makes this statement against the world, and it's a powerful word. I want to read it to you. In John chapter 7, verse 7, let me just share this passage because Jesus makes an incredible declaration here. And I want you just to, to, to follow along as I, I share this passage. Jesus talking to his disciples, and he makes this statement in John 7, verse 7. He says, the world cannot hate you. But he says this, but it hates me. And he says this, because I testify of it that its works are evil. Do you understand? The workings of the world are evil. Now, we say, but, but we do so good. Hey, listen, <laughs> you don't do it to the glory of God. You may do good, but it's not to the glory of God. And, and when you try to do good and you try to make those things, and he says, and, and Jesus nails the nature of this world. He says, listen, he said, you have to understand the world hates me because I testify that its deeds are evil. And we understand just what, remember what we read there, what, what Paul said there in Ephesians. He said that we literally, he said this, that we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of our flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. This is our bent. This is what we do. This is who we are. And so when we look at this area that we begin to see, okay, where, where is the world and how is it at and what does it do? In Romans chapter 3, I'm going to read a couple of verses to you. Um, No, I'm not. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let that one go. But it says this. Every one of us rebel against God's authority and his law. This is, this is the, the nature in us. And so um, we understand that, that, that God with his, his authority, when he declares his word, he's done this. I don't know if you ever heard someone say, I made a lion in the sand. And, and, and what God does is this. is With his word, he says, I'm going to make a lion in the sand. Now, we don't stand idle. That's not our nature. We literally cross over. We move across that line and say, I'm going to do this. What are you going to do? 
what are you going to do to stop me? If I want to do it, I'm going to do it. And so when God in his word makes a line in the sand, it's an amazing thing that we just don't stand by, that we consciously, willfully, actively simply say, I'm going to step over the line. That's our nature. But then God in his grace does something amazing. He convicts us of our sins. He says, I'm going to tell you, what you are, I'm going to tell you what your nature is, and I'm going to cause you to begin to grieve over that, to not want that part of your nature. I'm going to give you a taste of something that's good. I'm going to give you a taste of me. And then he gives us so wonderfully this conviction for sin, and then through his grace, he gives us the faith that we can accept Christ. Now, as soon as he gives us that faith to accept Christ, then what happens is this. He gives us the Holy Spirit in our lives, and that begins to remove the corruption of sin. Because now with the Holy Spirit in us, we have a new nature. Now we have this new nature that is in tune with God, and we have this old nature that we're trying to say, just get away from me, get away from me. But what happens is this, as we go through life, you know as well as I do, that when you have those two natures that certain times one will seem like it's more dominant than the other. There are times like when we're like Moses and we're sitting with the Lord and hearing with the Lord. It seems that our spiritual nature is just strong and that the flesh comes knocking. It's like, I don't need you. I got God. What do I want you? But there are other times in our walks where we're not hanging out with God. We're not absorbed in his word or seeking his heart. And all of the things of the world begin to just knock on the door and begins to feed us and encourage us to the world's way. And then what happens to our flesh? It becomes stronger. It's amazing that whatever nature we feed is the one that, that is, is there, that is the strongest within us. And so, so beautifully what the word of God does is this. The word of God is spoken. And it's going to have, according to scripture, the same effect with two separate results. I know that sounds weird, but let me explain to you what I mean. In the book of Acts, I want to start reading in chapter 2, verse 37. And then I'm going to jump over to verse or chapter 7. But beginning in Acts 2, verse 37, it makes this statement, Peter's preaching. And it says this, and when they heard this, it says this, they were cut. To the heart. All of a sudden, there, there's an opening now to my inside. And as these people had the opening cut to the heart, they said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? They saw their heart. They saw that it was wicked. And they said, what do I have to do to cleanse it? And Peter simply says, repent. Let everyone you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Regenerate. New nature. But then in Acts chapter 7, something amazing happens in this verse 54. It actually makes this declaration. Let me read this to you. But in Acts 7 verse 54 as Stephen is, is preaching, as he's proclaiming, it makes this statement. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. You understand? The word of God was spoken to both. Both were opened up. One opened up and they saw that their heart was black. They saw their true nature. They said, what do I have to do? What do I have to do to make this not black? And the others, what they did is, as the word of God came and they were opened up and they saw their heart, they were just mad. They were mad because other people saw the look of their heart. And, and it's an amazing thing. We don't want people to see a real heart. We try so hard to make it sound so we're so good at this and we're so good at that. We're such nice people. We always want people to see the best in us. And, and yet the reality is, is that so often we're like this. When the word of God comes, and, and I am no exception. Don't, don't, don't make this mistake. I am no exception. When the word of God comes and it opens it up to my heart, I see black. 
I see black. I realize I am not what I want to be yet. I mean, and, and, and I understand the depths of what my heart is. And, and it's easy to mask because we all look at the outward. Oh, but what does God look at? God looks at the heart. He understands what it is. And so when it comes to this area of, of just having this sin nature, I want you to understand as we go through these next couple of verses what it is that we're hardwired to do. So first and foremost, we begin to see this, that, that man is hardwired to trust his own ability. You can just jot that down. Man is hardwired to trust his own ability. Um, yet the word of God, I don't know if, if you've ever run into a problem when you go, oh, I, I can fix that. I got that. Oh, we can do this. This is not a problem. I can do that. I know how to fix that. I can, you know, and, and yet the, the, the word of God is pretty clear. John makes this statement in his gospel, John chapter 15. Let me read to you just a couple of verses, verses four and five, where Jesus is talking about the vine, but he makes this statement in John 15, beginning in verse four, abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches, he who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. And then he says this, for without me, you can do nothing. So when we have this thing of saying, no, I, 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 can, I can do that. I can fix this. And I'm able to do that because of our abilities, because of what we think we can do. And even if it's not perfect, what I want is good enough. And yet... What we should want is, I don't want this to be done unless it's God's will that it should be done. I want God's will in my life. And in whatever form he puts that in my life, that's what I want to do. Rather than this is what I want to do and this is what I'm going to do. And so I don't want to have these inconveniences of having to wait for God to decide when this is going to happen. I know how to fix it, Lord. I know how to take care of this. And so we believe so often that we know when the time is right and we're not willing to wait on God. There's two passages I want you to jot down for you note takers. The first is found in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31. It makes this statement. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary, they shall walk and not faint. So it's an amazing, beautiful passage that God gives to us within this whole area of just waiting on the Lord and waiting on the Lord. In the New Testament book of Philippians chapter 4, a couple of verses to jot down, verse 6 and 7, and then I'm going to read verse 19. But in Philippians 4, beginning in verse 6, he simply says what? Be anxious for nothing. Don't, don't be anxious, just, just wait. Be anxious for nothing. And he goes on to say, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Now, this is an amazing thing. So often we can let our requests be known unto God, but are we thankful when he's waiting? This is a tough one. We're not hardwired to give God thanks when he's not doing what we want when we want it. And, and these are the things that, that we understand the children know so well. Babies learn it. When I go wham, you come running. You're either going to change my diaper. You're going to give me a bottle. You're going to burp me. You're going to rock me. You're going to do something. I go wham, you come running. And, and then eventually, as they get a little bit older, they realize, no, that doesn't work anymore. But they have this mindset that this is the way it is. And so we think when God says, I'm going to delay something, what do we do? We go, wah, we're not thankful, like, oh, thank you so much, Lord, that, that you're waiting till I am ready to receive this blessing in the fullness of what it is. That rather than taking it too soon and not being able to use it or maybe abusing it, but I'm going to trust in you that, that you're doing the work in me so that when I'm ready, then I can have the fullness of the blessing and be able to use it in the way that you intended to use and I can bring glory to you. And so I love the fact he simply says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And then he says this, and the peace of God, 
which surpasses all, stand, all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So he says, when I'm waiting, I'm going to have peace. Now, I don't know about you, but my nature, I'm not hardwired to have peace when I'm waiting. Patting the thing, twiddling the thumbs, what's happening, pacing back and forth, what's going on, praying now, back on my knees. Okay, God, you know, where, where's the rain? Where's the cloud? Show me something. And, and I'm constantly saying, Lord, I don't have this peace while I wait. I'm not hardwired because to, to have this, this, this desire to wait on God because I want it now. I, want, I, I can do it now, Lord. Just, just, just give me the right guys and the right tools and let me just take care of this. And, and I love what God does. He even says, when he says, okay, we're going we're gonna to build this tabernacle. And we talked about the guys that were going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And, and God says, but I don't want you to rush this. Take the Sabbath. Come seek me. Check out my heart. Don't, don't rush on those things. And then in Philippians 4.19, he makes this statement. And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. He's going to supply the need. Not necessarily the wants, but he's going to supply all the needs. But we want them. I want the wants. I want these things. And so often we have this area where man is, is hardwired. We're here to rush things. Look at verse 1 again of our text in Exodus 32. It says, now when the people saw that Moses was delayed. In other words, there was more than three cars in the drive through So you got to find another you know, fast food joint to go. I'm not waiting behind three cars. But when the people saw that Moses delayed coming down from the mountain... The people gathered together to Aaron and said to him, Come, make us gods that shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. It's interesting. They don't want to wait anymore. Now, we do understand that, that God is going to say, It's going to be 40 days. I'll be there. Moses is going to come talk to me. And Moses, when I return... I'm going to return. I'm going to go talk to God. When I return, then, then, then we'll move on to God's direction. But I'm here to get the full direction from God. And as long as it takes, that's what I'm doing. But they were not going to wait. They waited long enough. And isn't that sometimes the way we are? We're hard right I've waited long enough. Now it's, it's my turn to act. It's my time to act. And, and this is what happens. This is part of that nature, the nature that we're hardwired to say, I don't want to have to wait on God, on his timing. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard young kids, but they don't say their age. They say, I'm almost 13 when they're 12. I'm almost 14 when they're 13. And so um, it's, it's an amazing thing that I'm almost, but you're not. I'm almost, but you're not. Not until you are, are you? But we always want to do what? Even baby Christians want to rush and I want to become mature. I love Jesus. I love this stuff. I want to become mature in my faith. Like There's only going to be one way to get mature in your faith, and that's time. Time in the Sabbath, falling down and getting up and knowing that you're going before the Lord and you're repenting and you're worshiping. And, and you're, you're being taught, and you're being sanctified. That's maturity. But you can't rush those things. But we always want to rush those things. And so I love the fact that the very first thing that we see is something that we're hardwired is trust in our own ability, trust in our own judgments, trust in our own timings. If I think it's done, it's done. And so, but God says, without me, you can do nothing. You have to wait on me. The second thing that we're hardwired to do is this is we have a tendency of lessening the words of God. Because remember, everything the Lord said the most, the Lord, we have a tendency of lessening the words of God to the words of a man. We have a tendency of, of lessening the works of God to something of just, hey, this happened by nature, it happened by choice. And so literally we are hardwired to lessen the works of God to say, oh, you know, that was just, Nature evolved in this way or, or um, chance just so happened to do that. That's where our world is in. We just said it's just big bang. It just so happened there was this big bang and everything just began to form fit so perfectly that, you know, that, that now we have this incredible world and all this life in it. And it just happened by chance. 
nature just just made it better and better and better and and amazingly my wife and i we were we were the other day we we're just walking out along the, the water we were noticing the waves and we were talking about the time we lived back in in california and and she also lived on the east coast and i lived out there for a while too but the waves that come and how beautiful the waves are and amazingly the waves are god's design to when the wave comes up and it splashes on the shore and the water goes back through the sand, it's a filtration system to clean out the oceans. And it just so happened that we had a moon. Just so happened that, that part of the the, 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 the the earth had a wart or something, it fell off and now it spins around, it's in the perfect location just so that it can cause tides and, and, and shows us times and see. All these things happen by chance, but that's our bent. We want to lessen the works of God to nature and to chance. We want to change the word of God to the change of, to the words of men. Notice what they say here in verse 1 of our text in Exodus 32, when they said the people saw that Moses delayed. So the people gathered together to Aaron and said, Come make us gods that shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. So they're saying that it's this man that brought him up. Moses brought him up. Now, I don't know about you, but back up a couple of chapters here in the book of, of, of Exodus and then back up to chapter 14 for just a second. Look at verse 31. It declares this. Thus Israel saw the great work which the Lord had done in Egypt. And so the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. In Exodus 15, the first four verses says this, Then Moses and all the children of Israel sang this song to the Lord and spoke saying, I will sing to the Lord for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and the rider, he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. And he is my God and I will praise him. My father's God and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his army, he is cast into the sea. He's chosen captain. His chosen captains are also drowned in the Red Sea. And the depths have covered them. They sank to the bottom like a stone. So amazing. In verse 6, he says this. Your right hand, O Lord, has become glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, has dashed the enemy in pieces. And, is, and the greatness of your excellence, you have overthrown those who rose against you. Absolutely amazing. And then we see in verses 11 through 13, it says this. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? You stretched out your right hand. The earth swallowed them. Now notice what they say in verse 13. This is key. You, in your mercy, led us forth. The people whom you have redeemed, you have guided them in your strength and to your holy habitation. They're saying, God, you took us, you led us, you moved us. And now like, what happened to this Moses, this guy who brought us up? Do you understand when you can say it's now a man who did it? Now it's, it's a lot easier to rebel against it when you can lessen God's word to not a commandment, to an opinion. You can lessen it to say, no, this isn't for me. And I think it's so important that, that our natural inclination is to always take what is God's and to lower it to some status that we get to pick and choose. We think that the Bible is Burger King. Pick and choose. Have it your way. I, I, I like the grace. Just leave out the, you know, the, the, the condemnation. That, that's not good. Leave out the conviction. I don't want that either. Just love and grace. That's what I want in my Bible. And just everything else will just not deal with it. Well, there's a lot of churches that do, as a matter of fact. They, they do it that way. But I think it's so important that we recognize that there is no other authority but God. 
and he has spoken this word. He has declared this word. And, and so when we, we recognize this, that our, our bent is to take God's word and to say, we get to choose whether we want to walk it or not. That's the bent. That's our hardwired. And yet with the spirit of God, it does what? No, this is life. The spirit of God always tells us this is life. This is love. This is power. This, this, this literally, this word it has this ability to transform my thinking, transform my heart, transform my actions. It becomes power in my life to walk the will of God. The other thing that we see is this. And so often, man is hardwired in our nature to want to have approval. And that's what we see here in verses 2 and 3. Read them with me, if you will. As we see in Exodus 32, verse 2, Then Aaron said to them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people broke off the golden earrings which were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received from their hand, and he fashioned it with an engraving tool, and he made a molded calf. And then they said... This is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. So when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. It's amazing that we're hardwired to want to have approval. That when you do something as nice as someone says, hey, that's a good job. How many times do we think, wow, I do this again and you never thank me. There, there's no gratitude for all the things that I do. And we're wanting to have some approval. And, and understand that the, the little kids do the same thing. They say, mommy, look at me. Mommy, look at me. Mommy, look. And, and so we look and all of a sudden they do their thing. And what do we do? Oh, we clap. Oh, that, that was an amazing jump that was an amazing jump. You almost got your tennis off the ground, and it was amazing. But we clap at them. Mommy, look. And, and I can't tell you how many times it is. Poppy, look. Poppy, look. And, and I'll tell you what. I'm amazed every time. I'm, it is the greatest thing ever. Whatever they do, I am thrilled with it. But it, it's, it's the approval. It's, it's always the approval. There's, there's a passage that, that, that Paul writes in Galatians chapter 1. It's important for us to get to this understanding. But in verse 10, he says this, For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I still please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. But I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which was preached by me is not according to men. The thing about men is this, is we want to have approval with the least amount of work. I don't want to have to do a lot to get the approval, but I want to be able to get this approval anyways. And so what happens is this, is, is the leaders are more apt to want to do the will of the people than to do the will of God. So I want to find out what the people want so I can do what the people want. And I don't even want anyone to say, what's the will of God? Because if what the people want is different than the will of God, don't ask the will of God, just ask what the people want, right? Because then you don't have a conflict. Then you don't have to say, what does God want in this situation? And I love the fact that whatever the people wanted, this is what Aaron wanted to do for them. We want you to look to us to say, yes, we're serving your needs. We're doing what you want us to do. And, and that's the hard thing. But we're hardwired to that. We're hardwired until the Spirit of God says, no, it isn't about what the people want. That, that if everyone in the world hates you like it hated Christ, that's okay. Because what I want to hear is this. I want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. That's my heart. And so... I think it's so important to recognize that the, the, the first is we're hardwired to, to always say, trust in my ability. I don't want to wait on God. We're hardwired to always lessen his works and lessen his words so that I can choose whether I want to do them. Make them not to say God brought us up, but Moses brought us up. That's enough. Or to hardwire to want approval. If the people want this. And so they said, listen, we need and this is what they said in verse 1. Come make us gods that shall go before us. Aaron says, I can do that. Give me some gold. 
because of course gods have to be made of gold. That's the best gods. So if you can do that, then you, we have even a better one to, you know, stand. And we got to make sure we tie him up so he doesn't topple or teeter. But we'll get this God going here. And amazingly, that's our, our, our hardwire. That we would rather have the applause of men than that assurance from God that you're doing my will. The fourth thing that we see is this, is we're, we're hardwired to, in a sense, always try to find nice answers to fit in little boxes. I don't know how many times that I've, I've shared with you multiple times that you know we can only know this, but we don't know beyond that. There's a lot of things we don't know, but we can know this according to scripture, and this is what we stand on. But <laughs> men are hardwired to always try to find, to have nice answers to fit in, in really comfortable little boxes. And so what they want to do is this, like the children of Israel here, they want to make a God with an image that they can relate to. Make us a God. Make, no, no, God is spirit. We don't even understand, can't fathom who he is, how his nature is, how his, his focus is, what he does. And so we don't have a clue to who this God is. And yet it's so important that what they want is this nice, tame little God. Now, eventually, when God did choose to reveal himself to them, remember there in Exodus chapter 19, what an incredible passage that was. That what, what God had done was this. That he said, okay, I want the people to come up. I want them to come see me. And, and so what happened was this. Verse 17 of Exodus 19. And Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet with God. And they stood at the foot of the mountain. And there on Mount Sinai was a golden calf. No, no, no. Nothing that easy. There on Mount Sinai was completely in smoke because the Lord had descended upon it. In fire, the smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace. The whole mountain quaked greatly, and the blast of the trumpet sounded long and became louder and louder. And Moses spoke, and God answered. And the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai and on the top of the mountain. The Lord called to Moses on the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. And the Lord said to Moses, Go down and warn the people. And eventually, what happens to this is. In verse 18 of, of Exodus 20, now the people witnessed the thunderings, they witnessed the lightning flashes and the sound of the trumpet, the mountain smoking, and the people saw it, they trembled and they stood afar off, and they said to Moses, you speak with us and we will hear, but let not God speak with us lest we die. They had that God, and now they want a nice little golden calf, something Nice, something that they can, you know, gravitate to. And, and so we see that as Aaron is now saying, okay, I want your approval. Now, whether he lacks faith, whether he lacks vision, whether he lacks ethics, whether he lacks all of it, whether he lacks humility to say, listen, I've got to have, you know, your approval or to feel good about myself. But keep in mind that these people, they, they want what they want, and there shall be no exceptions. In the book of Romans, I want to read you just a portion of it. In Romans chapter 11, beginning in verse 33 and verse 34, let me share this passage to you. But it says this, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgment and his ways past finding out. For who has known the mind of the Lord and who has become his counselor or who was first given to him and it shall be repaid. We can't ever fully understand our infinite God. But we try to make him finite. We try to make him so, oh, you can fit into this perfect little box of my theology and then I'm happy and then I'm content and I don't want anyone to spill open the box, add more of you so that my box can't contain you. I need to have it neat and orderly because it's easier to make God in, in an image that I'm comfortable with, to lessen him in his greatness, to say, yeah, come come, and, and be a part of this work of a God that, that I can just simply say, you're like a puppy, you're a little calf. You know, it's easier. I mean, think about it. It's, it's, it's easier to tell people come to church when there's no smoke and there's no lightnings and the ground's not shaking there in the parking lot. It's just nicer to say, just come on in. The building's lit. It's heat. It's, it's got cool coolness when it's summertime. These are the things, but we, we try to lessen God. And we try to make him 
and his word and his and his his nature into something that we say I can fully understand you now. And if God is so small that we can understand him or fit him in the box, he's just really too small to be our God. And he re reveals himself over and over, expand your theology, expand who you what you know of me, because you'll never fully understand. You can understand a little of what I give to you, but you won't fully understand all of who I am. And the last thing is this, that men are hardwired to do a religious work versus pursuing a religious relationship. Let me, let me share it here in verse 6. It says this, they arose early the next day. Oh, let's back to verse 5. So when Aaron saw it, he built an altar. He built an altar before. And Aaron made the proclamation, tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. And they rose early the next day. They offered burnt offerings. They brought peace offerings. The people sat down to eat and drink. And they rose up to play. The men are so hardwired to be satisfied with, I gave you an offering. I'm good. I did this work, I'm good. I read my Bible in the morning, I'm good. And it isn't about having this intimate living relationship with God. It's about doing one thing and thinking that I'm good because I've done that thing. And, and that's what we stand on. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 29, verse 13, jot it down, let me read it to you. Isaiah 29, 13, therefore the Lord said, and as much as these people draw near with their mouths and honor me with their lips, but have removed their hearts far from me, and their fear towards me is taught by the commandment of men. Men are simply saying, hey, look at what I've done. I've done an offering. Look at what I've done. Look at the outward. Look at the outward. Look at the outward. And men look at the outward. God looks at the heart. And, and, and he recognizes that, yeah, we have this bent. We're hardwired to say, I want a religion that I can do good at, that I can excel at, that I can be amazing at, versus saying, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And if I do more than anyone else, if I'm different than anyone else, it is not I, but the grace of God that is in me. That's the only thing that I can tell you is that God is good. And that God chooses to say, I'm going to use this guy. I'm going to use this time. I'm going to use this word. I'm going, to, I'm going to use these things, and I think it's so important to, to recognize this thing that we have a tendency to say, but if I've done it, if I, as long as I just go through the motions, isn't it the same? It's definitely not. It's not. I want your heart. I don't want the actions. I want your heart. And above all things, and when, you're, when your heart is wrong, I'm going to tell you your heart is wrong. And we're going to see that as, as we look to, to the next week when it comes to the response to sin. This here is simply the reasons for sin. Man, we are born with a sin nature. And all these things that we do, all the things that the world do that we're frustrated, keep in mind, it's their nature. It is simply their nature. When a sow is washed, she goes right back into the mud. It's her nature. It's what she does. And so we, we take a look to these things and we recognize that, okay, there are these things that are the nature of men, but we're different. We're different. Because, saints, we have the Spirit of God, and we now have this new nature that's in us. And keep in mind, they're warring. And understand, it's good that they're warring, because if your natures are warring, you're dead. Just, just be glad they're warring, because if it's not warring, it's just the old carnal nature, and it's happy. But if you have this new nature warring against the old nature, then keep in mind, you have a new nature. You're now alive in Christ. And then because it's warring, it's good. If you want to see victory in the war, be like Moses. Hang out with the Lord. Hang out with the Lord and, and, and seek him and hear his words and, and know his heart and grow with him and just be in the light. As, as you are there in the light, then you're going to reflect that light. People are going to see, wow, you've been hanging out with God. It was amazing. They look at the disciples and say, man, these are untrained men, but they knew one thing. They had been with Jesus. Jesus rubbed off on them. And as Christians, he rubs off on us. And let that be our testimony to who we are um, with this new nature. Amen? Oh, Father, we are so grateful for this word. So often we don't want to look at the reality of the 
reason for sin. We try to blame others. We try to blame our heritage. I do it because I'm German. I do it because I'm Irish. I do it because whatever um, nationality I want to claim. But, but Lord, it's, it's sin. It's the nature. I'm born with it. I'm, I'm hardwired with it. But, but God, we are so grateful that you give us a new nature. That you've shown us through this passage that what they did, they did it because they're hardwired to do it. This is the natural bent of man. But we don't have to be those men and women. We get to have the new nature. We get to have your working in and through us. And we know this. That what you have started, you will complete. And we're so grateful for that. Thank you for giving us your spirit, the new nature. Thank you for teaching us your word in this area of your heart. And, and that we're not aware, Lord, of just when we see we're hardwired to this, to realize that's not who I am anymore. I don't have to be hardwired. I want to wait on you. I want your spirit to move. I want to hear from you. I, I, I want to, to take your words as they are the words of my creator, my God, my savior, words of truth and words of light and words of life, words of power. And Father, help us not to look for the approval of men because all we want to hear is those words, well done, good and faithful servant. So continue that work within our hearts, Lord. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen.